Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. This week's episode is incredibly exciting for me because we had the chance to spend two hours with one of the world's most interesting artists, film directors, writers, and of course, humorists in the last century, Woody Allen. We were extremely fortunate that Woody Allen agreed to sit with us for a long time to discuss his views on the world, his films, and his thoughts about things from philosophy to science. I realize that for some people, this conversation itself will be controversial, the very fact that we're airing a conversation with Woody Allen. For those people, I would say I'm reminded of, of, of a conversation I had with Ricky Gervais earlier at, at the beginning of our podcast, where he said that people that get angry that conversations happen that they don't want to hear are like people who go downtown and see a sign saying guitar lessons for sale outside a door and say, I don't need any damn guitar lessons. Well, if you don't want a guitar lesson, don't go in. If this podcast for any reason upsets you, don't listen to it. But if you do listen to it, I think you'll be fascinated. And I am particularly thankful that Willie Allen trusted me and our crew to come in earlier this year before the the pandemic and have a long conversation in his studio in New York City. And I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did when we had the conversation. With no further ado, Woody Allen. Well, Woody, uh, thanks so much for agreeing to do this. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to oh, talk sure. to you this way. I'm happy to. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see how you feel about that after this is <laughs> over. There, there's so many things to want to talk to you about, but I, but what I want to be since this is kind of an origins podcast, I wanted to start with your origins. You didn't like school, did it, not. No, yeah, and I read that you were ejected early. Is that really true? Were you kicked out? Uh, yes, and now I, I want to be fair. School <laughs> didn't like me uh, with equal <laughs> enthusiasm. Sure, you know I, it's not that I was a wonderful student and I had disdain for school. Mm. Uh, we didn't like each other. Okay. Um, I went to a public school and then high school. Mm -hmm. Didn't like public school, didn't mm -hmm. like high school. And then to keep my parents from jumping off the roof, I went to college for a very short time. In my, in my freshman year, I took just, just a drop dead easy course. I was a motion picture production major. Oh, really? <clears throat> and I only took it, not that I was interested in um, making movies at that point in my life. I only took it because I figured the curriculum, uh, you go to the movies. That's what you do. You go <laughs> and you talk about them. So I like going to the movies and I figured it was a goof off course <laughs> and I'd be able to, you know, I wasn't serious. Oh. I had no thoughts in those days of being a movie director at all. Wow. I just wanted to avoid schoolwork. Uh -huh. Now I was, let me tell you how terrible a student I was. Okay. In high school, Midwood High School, I had two years of Spanish. Mm-hmm. Two years, Two years of Spanish. <laughs> when I went to NYU, I conned them into letting me take Spanish freshman as mm. though I had never had any Spanish at all. Okay. And I Mark. failed it. And you failed. <laughs> now, I was sitting in a classroom with, you know, 20 other kids, whatever, yeah. and they had no Spanish at all. I had two years of, of Spanish. Spanish, but I was the one that failed. But you made so, it through those I was years. not a good student. Um, also, at that stage of my life, I was trying to learn to play the drums because oh, okay. I was very interested in jazz music. And there would be certain exercises with the foot pedal that you had to practice. Yeah, sure. So I would sit in class and the teacher would be lecturing about uh, Beowulf or something. Yeah. And I'd be doing paradiddles and things with mm. my feet. And I was kind of one, one, two, one, one, two, <laughs> one, two. You know, so I wasn't paying attention. I learned nothing. In addition to that, uh, I lived in Brooklyn, and NYU, where I went, was on 8th Street. You know, mm. you got off at 8th Street on sure. the train. I'd take the train to 8th Street. Mm -hmm. The doors would open, and I'd sit there for a minute, and i think, do I want to go? Do I not want to? Okay. Should I go to the show? And I'd tergiversate for just enough time 
for the, the doors, doors to close. And then I'd go up to Broadway and 42nd Street. Street and hang out in the Automat or the Paramount. And so between playing hooky and my poor scholastic aptitude uh-huh. and their uh, hostility toward me and my indifference toward them, the atmosphere was not conducive towards being educated. Sure. They came to that conclusion <laughs> Before, before I did. Before you did, they beat you yeah, to it. Okay. They came to it on their own, and they got me into a room with a, a conclave of deans. Now, a conclave of deans yeah. Yeah. I think is that's not the like term. an exaltation of locks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's a, you know, it's a group of like four drips that sit around a table, <laughs> and they're telling you in no uncertain terms mm. why you're out. And... You know, I had no real argument with them because mm-hmm. what could I say? My marks were poor. I didn't attend a lot. I, When I did attend, I was practicing my foot pedal mm-hmm. on the drums. So, you know, they threw me out. And... Uh, and as well they should have. Did your drumming get better as a result of the class? Uh, no, no, I gave up <laughs> the drums after a while. Yeah, but the, you were interested in music then. You were always interested in music, though. You were always uh, uh, From teenage on, yes. I was always interested in playing music. So your parents wanted to go to college. Like my, my, my Jewish parents, my mother wanted me to be a doctor. I don't know what. Did yeah. your mother, did your mother, father have any, did they want you yeah, to be? Yeah, all the kids in the neighborhood that I went to school with yeah. were becoming doctors yeah. and lawyers and accountants accountants and architects mm. and and professors in school. Mm. I mean, they all had noble ambitions. I didn't. I had sleazy underworld ambitions. I wanted to be a gambler, a car cheat, uh, a con man, I, I anything so I would not have to, you know, work, or punch a time clock or sit in an office. Or I would have been... You know, if I didn't have the ability to write comedy, mm-hmm. which is pure luck, it has nothing to do with any achievement of mine or work of mine, it's pure luck. It's like hitting a, a, the mega ball or something. Mm-hmm. I, I would be probably doing some menial kind of job. I was. I would be delivering for the florist or <laughs> messenger service mm-hmm. or something, because I wouldn't want a job in an office. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. want to be sitting behind a desk all yeah. day. And I don't want to say to people, you know, uh, you'll get a lot of good wear out of this shoe, <laughs> you know, or, or you know, I, I just didn't want to do that yeah, or sure. open wide. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't want any of those jobs. Mm-hmm. I, so I would have probably done a job that, let me be out in the street. And there's very few jobs for a totally unskilled, uneducated, irresponsible person. <laughs> and I, I would have been, uh, you know, uh, I guess a messenger or something. Well, in some extent, that's why I became an academic, too. It's kind of a non-working job. Non-working, yeah. yeah. yeah I've, I mean, I've never worked a day in my life. It, I mean, uh, and... But it's pure luck. It's just a, well, we'll see. A I'm blessing. Not, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of luck. I think there's a lot of effort. But I wanted to know why, because you look. I mean, I'm heading towards the fact that you are incredibly. You cultured. Can't, can't find the word. Yeah, yeah, I'm incredibly no, no, something, no, thinking, but the word doesn't things. quite exist. Exactly, it doesn't to, to quite exist. I'm incredibly I'm what? Uh, <laughs> but cultured, but knowledgeable, erudite. You know, literature. Music, philosophy, art, in terms of ideas, you're fascinated with ideas, but somehow you got turned off school. Now, I know that I've been reading, and it seemed to me part of the reason maybe you had miserable teachers. I had miserable teachers, yes. I was, But I was also miserable. I don't mean to, you know, blame it all on them. They were terrible. And I was, You know, the education system is not good. And the education system, certainly when I grew up, I don't know if it's changed, yeah. but the, the burden of education was all on the student. I'm just saying I had no interest. I was not a reader as a kid. Yeah. You know, I only, only, only read comic books. That was it. Just comic just books. Comic and books. I mean, I mean, to a, I don't know, I would say 16 years old, maybe 17. You just read, com- you know, what comic books, by the way? Do you- I read all the standard comic books, mm-hmm. Superman, Captain Marvel, yeah, Batman, yeah. and the Green Lantern, mm-hmm. all that stuff. And 
I read with great pleasure Walt Disney and Little Lulu and, uh, you know, the <laughs> Mighty Mouse. Uh, I, I just loved it all. And yeah. you, you see, when you see a 15-year-old kid or a 16-year-old kid and he's eating lunch and he, his comic book is open to, <laughs> you know, uh, Woody Woodpecker or something, <laughs> you know, you think, gee, what is it with this kid? So I was completely uneducated. And unlike my sister, who loved always to read her idea of heaven is to, you know, get a couple of books and just yeah. lay down and read forever. I had no interest in reading at all. It never interested me as a kid. I didn't like it. Time spent other ways was my thing. And I only got educated, not for any noble or ambitious reason. I only did because when I hit about 17 years old or 18 years old, I, I was attracted to the girls in school. Uh -huh. And the girls that I liked, for whatever strange reason I don't know, were the kind of non-commercial bohemian girls, the girls that had no lipstick and very little makeup and black tights and black turtlenecks and silver earrings. And they were all interested in art and culture and literature and uh, classical music and architecture and, uh, you know, and so in order to keep up my end of the conversation, mm -hmm. I had to learn. So, and so, so was the girls. I, I learned, but if it wasn't for them, you know, if, if I liked a different type of mm -hmm. girl, for yeah. instance, who was, who was not interested mm -hmm. in that, if her interest lay elsewhere, uh, you know, I, I would never have learned. But the ones I liked, for whatever reason, there were all those ones that you used to see in the Jules Pfeiffer cartoons yeah. or, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that liked to hear the guitar players sure. doing folk music. Yeah. And they were socialists and they were communists. And I they see a lot of them in, their, in your movies. That's the, I see those in yeah. the early movies especially, yeah. Those are the ones. And, and so, uh, you know, if they would, at first when I started going out with them, they would talk to me, and I was, you know, I had nothing to say back to them. I never read anything they read. I didn't know who Andre Segovia was. I, you know, I mean, yeah. I didn't. And gradually, to keep, you know, to be able to get a second date, or even a first one at times, I had to start reading and uh, and so I did read, and some of it I liked and some of it I didn't. But the problem with being self-educated mm -hmm. is that there are huge gaps Gap, yeah, in gaps. your education. Mm -hmm. So there are some subjects I know pretty well and can yes. talk about. Yeah. And there are other things you think, my God, you mean you've never mm -hmm. read any Charles Dickens or, or something? Moby no, Dick. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, although, you know, it seems to me that you, when I look at the, at least the references in, in your writing and the movies, they, they, it's an, at least in terms of literature, it seems to me to be remarkably broad. I, I, you wrote once that you were not a, well, you said you were not a habitual reader, but you said it's a chore to read and you don't read for pleasure. You mm -hmm. read because it was important to read. Now I know why it was important to read. I, yeah. didn't, I never got it from, from what I read from you. Now I know what, yeah. but, but surely it isn't that way now. I mean, you, when, you, when I read what you write or say in interviews, you talk with pleasure about, just with total pleasure about Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Sartre, Camus, poets, Yeats, Dickinson, mm -hmm. Eliot, Rilke. All, I mean, it seems to me that there's a love ultimately of those people. So was there a switch that was turned or, or do you still not read for pleasure? I don't, I read very rarely for pleasure. I don't read much for pleasure. There are very few books in my life where the burden of entertainment was completely on the author. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about fiction now. Sure. I can read some poetry uh, because uh, many of the poems are short and <laughs> do not require a lot of mm -hmm. extended concentration. Yeah. Um, novels, it's not my, my pleasure of first choice. Yeah. I'd always rather see a movie, see mm -hmm. a, a show in the theater, mm -hmm. listen to music, watch a ball game, you know. And I read a certain amount of nonfiction, again, just to keep up in a conversation. But it's, it was just never a great, great 
um, pleasure for me. Well, I, I got but, off to a bad start, I guess. Yeah, well, that's the bad start, I think, is the key point. I think, I mean, I, again, I keep blaming your early teachers. I think I love a description you wrote once about teachers. You said, talk, talk, talk. But when you see them, they're mean looking, sorry, sad, and bitter. You know what their lives were like. And, and you said you imbibed from the from school Socratically rather than intellectually just by looking at your teachers and learning how miserable their lives were. Yes, and it's also the the stuff they gave you to read, the stuff they gave you in school was no fun. It was, first of all, antiseptic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, do you really want to read uh, Gift of the Magi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're a kid. You want to <laughs> yeah. read about, when I was a kid, I wanted to read about guns and gangsters and excitement and mm -hmm. war stories and intrigue and spies. And I don't want to read about you know, her her combs and his <laughs> watch fob and, you know, and everything they picked out for you had that kind of bland, antiseptic, don't, you know, offend anybody. Mm -hmm. God, these kids are, are so, so... And it was the same with music. When you went into your music periods or auditorium mm -hmm. periods, there was so much beautiful music out there, so much yeah. Cole Porter, so much George Gershwin and Jerome Kern that was pleasurable to listen to and, and they could have turned you on to music so it was a true pleasure. They didn't. You would go in there and they would, you'd sing Abide With Me or, or <laughs> you know, Recessional or, you know, I mean, stuff that, you know, amelodic. Yeah. Uh, antiseptic or solemn stuff that was joyless to kids. Well, and so, you know, I I didn't get educated very much because uh, I didn't have a background. Or, or, in, or the right kind of person, apparently background. at home or, or at school. But now two things, though. If your parents didn't listen to music, where did you get your love of music? Was it again, I mean, was it in some sense rebelling against your parents, your friends, your peers, your peer group, because music was I listened cool? to pop music. No, uh, on, on the, the radio. radio. The, the radio, radio was a big deal, and mm -hmm. it was a big deal. You know, you get up in the morning, radio would go right on, because it wouldn't interfere with your, uh, you know, your your matutinal ablutions. You could yeah. just do yeah. your thing, yeah. and, and, and it was fine. So, you know, the radio was on, and I'd be getting dressed and showering, and uh, I showered first, then I got <laughs> dressed, and then, Oops. you know... Uh, breakfast and you and the music beyond yeah, the music in those days you know talking about many years ago now was you know Benny Goodman and Artie mm. Shore and Billy Holiday and Peggy Lee and it was great music and it was Gershwin and Kern and Irving Berlin and Rogers and Hart mm. and so that gets baked into you yeah sure and so you you know you like it I well, mean, and it obviously like influenced it. your taste because we're always made one. You again, when I think about your music taste, there or at least in terms of the music you use for the movies, it's very broad. It's not just it's not just jazz, of course, which which appears in a lot of movies, but it's Stravinsky, it's 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 Prokofiev, it's every it's it's the classics as well. Which yeah, I, I love I classical guess, music too. Again, that came later. I assume. that came later. Yeah, that. Uh, that was the later thing. You know, at, at first, we never heard any classical music. I grew up on yeah. Harry James and... Yeah, me you too. Know, I never... Those the swing musicians. And when when I got older, and uh, actually, I married young, and my wife came home from school and said, you got to hear this. She had the Brandenburg Concerto. Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, she said, they we took this in school, and, and she played them for me, and they were... Good, I like them, and and so she got me into listening to classical music, and I did it more and more, and I, and I, um, you know, and this past summer, if you can believe it, me who was a stickball aficionado and champion in <laughs> the Brooklyn streets was at La Scala directing a Puccini opera. Really? Yeah. So wow. so I have developed. Wow. In spite of myself, in spite of all my, <laughs> my, you know, obstacles and reluctance and well, laziness I, and but bad that's habits, good. it gives hope. You see, it gives hope. It's hope, people. yeah. That it's hope that, for everyone. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I grew up on on none of this. Mm -hmm. None of, did not grow up on classical music or literature or anything. I grew up playing stickball, playing yeah, punchball, sure. playing stoopball, playing baseball, mm, yeah. schoolyard basketball. 
and 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 I wound up making a living in the arts. Yes, it's, it's, uh, did you have any good teachers? By the way, yes. Uh, in in there were a couple of good teachers. Well, you had. I have to say, you had a biology teacher that I liked at least, namely Jesse Kiosian, Mrs. Oh. Kiosian, who who was in uh, um, Oedipus Rex. You're, the, the She's short been in a couple of films. A couple, of, couple of. She yeah. was a biology. She's a cute little biology teacher. She was a tiny, tiny little teacher at Midwood High School, and uh, and I think I was in her class. But I know she was a bio teacher there, and I, I think I was in her class. Years, years later, I was looking for interesting types for small parts, and Juliet Taylor, my casting director, said, I met this wonderful mm -hmm. woman who mm -hmm. says she knows you, and she's a great type. And and then she said her name, and I said, well, yes, yeah, sure, I, I do remember her from Midwood. I can't recall if I was in her class or not. And then she came in, and I used her, and, and she was wonderful. She was a tiny little thing, and she loved culture in general. Yeah, did she you find that out afterwards? Everything. You didn't. You surely didn't find that when you were a student. I mean, no, when a mean, student, I I yeah. fled the yeah. class always. But she, but she loved but, culture. But when I saw her, I remember seeing her once when I went with my then wife to a little tiny private classical piano recital upstairs in a walk up in the east village mm -hmm. some guy was playing some sonatas and and Jesse Kiosian was there oh. and I said hey, I she was my biotin and then years later she showed up uh, in casting and 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 was very good yeah no i i thought the fact that she had the husband to show up for casting must she must have been at least a i would have thought she would be a fun teacher well I want to switch a little bit. So, so you didn't find out what you were interested in, in school, really. Um, although it's interesting to me, it is interesting to me, given what you've done since, that the teachers you found interesting were English teachers, in, in, both in high school and in, and in university. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, I, I have to just interrupt you for a second. Um, when I first went to college at NYU and had the English teacher, mm -hmm. you know, he was a guy, and we had to hand in our first essays, and I handed in my essay, and he failed me on it mm -hmm. and said, uh, sent me back the paper and said, son, you need a lesson in rudimentary manners. You are a callow adolescent and not a diamond in the rough. Wow. And uh, now I was at that time trying to write funny, yeah. and I had some talent because I was, while I was in that class, I was being... Paid. I was working as a comedy writer, so I wasn't. I, I did have some talent as a writer, but instead of um, encouraging me or saying, yeah. you know, look, this is this may not have hit the mark, mm -hmm. but but uh, you know, if you want to write comedy, I would suggest you read S. J. Perelman or Robert Benchley or something. Mm. There was no, the teachers never stimulated you. They there was never any, they didn't know how to. That's so sad. To make the most of it. Now, you know, I didn't care. I thought the guy was a screwball yeah. and, you know, I couldn't care less. Uh, but you, uh, if you think if he'd been different, it would have made a difference to you at that time? Or he'd already turned I think off? if he had said, I want to speak to you after school and it wasn't that uh, mm -hmm. dressing yeah, down, yeah, yeah. if you want to speak to me and say, look, you, you know, if you want to write comedy, uh, I can, you know, I, can I, I think you struck out here. Yeah, but yeah. but I, I, I tr try reading these things and, you know, try again and see... After you read, you see if you think these are funny, and let's mm -hmm. talk about it. Sure. But there was never any, you know, if you didn't do it, you failed. And yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, oh, that's just what about what about science? Because the reason I'm asking is, it seems to me that you have at, at some level a scientific sensibility, which is really asking questions about the universe. And in fact, you know, I was struck early on, obviously because of my own interest. When I, before I knew you, you know, there's wonderful lines about the universe expanding. What's the point? And you know, and and everything's and protons are decaying. So I mean, there's one of the, one of your movies where you're going around saying, "But protons are decaying. What's the point?" And so you had this. At least you were following what was going on. And in fact, we first met when I think you were subjected to me talking about physics. I think, and and 
Were, was there ever any thought or interest in science? Yes, as a boy, I was I was interested in science. But very, it got, you bet he got turned off. Yeah, that's I what was, happens to so many kids. I was uh, interested. I, I uh, my parents bought me uh, at my urging a microscope a mi- and, uh, and a chemistry kit, maybe a Lionel chemistry of course. set. Yeah, those were great. And uh, with the cabinets that opened, yeah. and there's many chemicals yeah. in it. And but I I didn't have the the strength of character or the or the richness of of you know, curiosity or the I didn't have it I was there was nobody's fault but my own I just because they when I expressed interest they did my parents did get me the microscope and did get me the the chemistry set years later but but I I, I just wasn't, I was a goof off. I was a okay, kid that a, wanted to watch baseball rather than, uh, and then when I got older, um, I became interested in all these, or, you know, physics mm-hmm. and uh, astronomy, I, interested in only in that the large questions, the unanswerable yeah. questions, uh, I came to the conclusion were the only questions worth asking or dealing with. Sure. Um, because, yes, of course, there's a great deal of difference if you're living under communism mm-hmm. or socialism or democracy, or and there's a great deal of difference in, in your living day to day and all these things that make up the warp and woof of politics. But in the end, if you had an ideal society and it was everybody who had enough money and everybody had their health and everything everything was great and there was no war and there was no climate change everything was solved you would still be faced with these terrifying unanswerable issues you still wouldn't be happy you say well yeah i got everything and <laughs> and then you think to yourself it would become even more poignant because <laughs> you'd be saying gee i'm I'm going to lose all this one day. Uh, it's all going to be taken away from me. Now, if your life is not so good, if you're struggling mm. to make a buck or to think up a couple of good jokes for the second act of mm. a play or trying to get your invention patented or something, you know, you're concentrated on a small thing and it takes your mind off that. Yeah. And so you, but in the end, sooner or later, if you accomplish everything you want in life, you still come up against these big questions, and the big questions are terrifying, and they're you know they're they're, they're no satisfactory answers, and so uh, I keep coming back to them mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah, sure, yeah, because so they're nagging. You're... Yeah, sure, they're, they're not the kind of questions you can say, "Well, can't answer that," and no one will ever answer yeah. it. So. But that's just, the scientific part of you. That's what the fact that you keep coming back to. I mean, I'm a physicist, a theoretical physicist, because it's those deep questions that intrigue me, and I keep liking to a- ask them and return to them. And for me, almost the questioning is as important as the answering. The fact that you keep searching, I guess, I find the conclusion equally the same: that the universe is meaningless and it's all going to end miserably. <laughs> but right, you but, you you want. The answers, but it isn't necessarily the answers you want. You want a certain set of answers, and it's not the answers that you're getting. Well, uh, no, I'm willing to take whatever the universe gives me, and it doesn't bother me that the universe is going to end miserably. Um, it's sort of uh, for me. It's always kind of, and we'll why, get to why it because I want to talk to you. It's a, it's a, it's a worrisome thought. It's a bothersome thought that uh, that the universe is flying apart and is everything will be gone. It's, but it makes it more. It makes the fact that you and I are here chatting so much more amazing to me. I guess that's my attitude: is that yes, we're cosmically insignificant, and we're going to be gone, and human civilization is going to end, and no, the universe doesn't care about us. In fact, it's trying to kill us in many ways. Doesn't matter, and the, and it's sure it's expanding, and it's eventually going to become dull, cold, dark, and empty. But hey, that means what an incredible f- stroke of fortune it is for me to have this little. Time with you. No, you have, you have to think about these things in fairly grim <laughs> terms. Sophocles said, "You know, better never to have been born at yeah. all." That's the greatest blessing. You, I don't know. You're you're here for a short amount of time, and uh, 
and you search for answers. Yeah. But it, uh, I feel that I'm not, I've never been searching, I've been searching for the answers I want to hear. <laughs> I don't want to come up with the answers you come up with. Yeah. You, as a physicist, mm -hmm. come up with substantial answers about the real structure and working of but those are not fun answers to hear they're not soothing answers well they're not soothing but they are inspiring because they must it, you, because it must resonate with you at some level because you learned enough about it to know that matter is decaying or or that the universe is expanding they're <laughs> I they're was hoping it wasn't <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah of course <laughs> you know I'm, yeah. and and i find i don't find them inspiring i find them dispiriting okay that you've got to you've got to find ways to go through the day with a dark cloud hanging over your head that uh, the the general uh, narrative of the universe is a negative, finite, <laughs> well, it's not, dreadful yeah, one. Well, it's negative as far as humans are concerned. There's amazing things going on. What about low? But if you're asking questions and the answer is not what you expected... Is that depressing? I expected it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. No, well, and I got the, it. You, you assume the universe is miserable, and it is. But, but in life in general, if you're asking questions about anything in the terms of your uh, art and your, what you're working on, and the answer comes out to be something you totally didn't expect, is that isn't that isn't that make you happy or does that if make... it's good if the answer is the seven numbers to the uh, 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 uh okay. lottery yeah fine <laughs> but but no if if the answer is if you're a little kid, mm -hmm. and you say, hey, how long do we live to your mm -hmm. mother? Yeah. And she says, oh, you know, people live to 100. And, and, mm -hmm. and then you get older and you say, hey, wait a minute, the life expectancy is uh, mm -hmm. 78 or something. Yeah. You've learned something, but you have not learned a good thing <laughs> or a pleasing thing. Well, and it's not a pleasing thing. It's I'm not, not sure whether it's good. You know, but if you know it's shorter, then do you think it becomes more precious? Or no, just be... it becomes more anxiety-ridden. Okay, good. Know? Well, we'll get, we'll get there because I can... Well, it's, it, there's issues. I mean, I've been... Because I've been reading you a lot and listening to you a lot to prepare for talking, one can deal with the absurdity of life. And if you want to call meaninglessness absurdity in a variety of ways. But one of the ways is comedy. Surely. I mean, do, did you get... Mm, no, very well, unsatisfying. Well, what, what, what you, none of the ways you're thinking of are satisfying. They're all selling yourself a bill of goods. Well, maybe they are, but but what else can we do? Um, in fact, when did you find out you were funny? Uh, I've always been... Uh, was had it, a sense of humor. I could always make people laugh. Was it, was it a family thing? I mean, I grew up mm -hmm. in a sort of a Jewish family where you had to you, you had to force your way into the conversation was happening everywhere, and you had to come up with something for people to listen to you. And I also had a role model. My uncle was very funny, and I saw how it endeared him to everyone around, and it made me mm -hmm. want to—I think it made me—I want to be that way. Was there anyone in your family? No, or, there's no one in my family that— was funny or made jokes or had any proclivity toward culture mm -hmm. or the arts or show business or so no and so when you what just funny was just natural uh, I, I have no idea where any of it came from i just know that when i was uh, a kid i could make people laugh and and i did and when i got to be an adolescent you know, people suggested uh, that I write write what I was saying down and sell it to people. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, and, and they were then, very then wise other to people suggest it, could... and they'd buy it, and that was that and... was very wise. Let me ask you, because of what you said about literature and what made you learn that, did it also help you with girls? The fact you were funny did that. that... Oddly enough, it's an interesting thing. Whenever they ask questions and do surveys and studies. Mm -hmm about what is uh, attractive about other people to either yeah. sex. Yeah. There's always a disproportionate emphasis put on sense of humor. Yeah. And they always say, well, I want someone who's kind to this, with a great sense of humor, yeah. who's funny, yeah. who's, uh, you know... It it always comes up. Yeah. To you know, guys talking about the women they want, women talking about the men they want. Yeah. For some reason... Funny is always right up there with the 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 real essentials of desirability. 
But did you note that? I mean, is that something you consciously were no, aware of no, as a, I, a young I, man? I, I even to this day can't figure why. Uh, no, not why, it, but it did it impact upon the fact that it, you knew it might help you meet? Or No, uh, no, no, no. I was never conscious. I, I, I just uh, assumed the, the women in my life that were attracted to me, th the fact that I was amusing was meaningful to them. To them, and it's mm -hmm. self-selecting, I guess, in that way. You said somewhere that comedy is about, always about insecurity in life, insecurity about women, fear, cowardice, difficulties in relationships. That's sort of the basis you claimed, at least in one place. Well, read. I mean, if you look at all the comedies that you see, whether it's uh, Bob Hope or Groucho mm. Marx or W.C. Mm -hmm. Fields or Charlie Chaplin, that's what 99% of it's about, yeah. you know, about fear, about anxiety, about, you know, falling in love, chasing after the woman and getting yeah. or not getting, yeah. you know, I mean, that that's where the jokes lie. That's where the jokes lie, except when I also think about your jokes, I think about existential themes, cosmology, death, <laughs> philosophy, there's, they're built into, the, those themes are built into into your jokes, uh, and they're much sort of, if you wish, a grander. And as you once said, the only things, the only questions worth asking are ultimately sort of those yeah, existential in, in ones. In my opinion, some, the, someone else would come to a, a very different opinion and feel that, um, you know, there are many questions, there are starving people and yeah, there are sure, terrible sure. things that need attention and, and my stuff is all you know, irrelevant nonsense. And meanwhile, the practical pain and living and suffering of real people mm -hmm. is what they have to deal with. I, I didn't feel that way. I mean, that was just my, I, I don't mean to inflict my ideas or my feelings on other people. For me, I just felt, given the circumstances of my life and what I observe around me and read in the papers or read in books, that those questions are questions that you ultimately have to come up with. When I did my movie, um, Stardust Memories. Memory, Stardust Memories, yeah, which you is know, one of my favorite. I felt that that was a question. People would ask me, gee, the character in your movie has got fame and money, mm -hmm. and uh, why? what has he got a right to complain? Well, he was complaining because fame and money does not, make a happy person is a cliche, but yeah. does not make a happy person. And he was complaining about that. And he was complaining, he was a lucky guy. Yeah. He was complaining for the millions of people mm -hmm. that don't have anything and have to wrestle with day-to-day -day living and all the terrible cruelties sure. of life. But, you know, but, you that, know, but that's, that's what I'm asking in some sense. Everyone seems to think hey, all your movies are autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Why? Why they do is an interesting question. They don't assume other people's movies are autobiographical. And, no. and, and I wondered if it's because the character you play in movies is a natural outgrowth of your stand-up. And so people always see the same, to some extent, the same character from the time you were before you're making movies to the time after, and therefore assumes it must be you. I, I you know, I once heard Marlon Brando say in an interview that people confuse him with the characters he plays yeah. and that he was not like that he was not stanley kowalski and mm -hmm. and i'm not like that <laughs> yeah no i mean i, uh, I think and I... and but if you see charlie chaplin for example mm -hmm. you know this guy puts on a little mustache and his cane yeah, and his yeah. hand and i play in a movie and i this is what i wear <laughs> yeah you know yeah so they th understandably think that the guy in Annie Hall or the guy in Manhattan or the guy in Annie is me, give or take a few emotions or a few exaggerations. And sometimes it is true that the character will be saying something that I babble about in yeah. life. Or, mm -hmm. But the characters in my movies are greatly exaggerated because otherwise the movies would really be dull. Yeah, yeah. If I was the character <laughs> in the movies, you would go to sleep yeah. in the first Not reel sure. and but, or leave the theater. So I have to exaggerate the characters tremendously. In real life, I'm not like I am in the movies. Maybe there's a touch here and there, a touch there, but... You no, know, I it's, think it's, it's, it's amazing. I, and I, I have to say, whenever... 
it, when people find out I, I, I know you, the first thing they say is, is he like he is in the movies? And I think it's the most, I've, I've read other people say the same thing. It's the most amazing thing because you are not at all, in my experience, no, I'm like, not, like, I'm not. like the characters in the movie. Ironic, relaxed, thoughtful, not not particularly neurotic, as far as I can see, all of, all of those things, and it's kind of interesting that those characteristics are what people. Well, it works. I mean, it works in the movies, and it's been it's, it's done it's very an well. Exaggerated for you. <laughs> character, but but in real life, I've led a very middle class, productive, mm. um, you know, well disciplined, responsible yeah. life. In 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 the movies, of course, the the character I'm playing is frantic and neurotic and, you know, meant to be amusing, sure. trying to amuse people. But people think that, uh, but, but if you were around me for a while, mm -hmm. uh, you, and I don't mean this self-deprecatingly or facetiously, you would see that I'm dull. I'm, I get up in the morning <laughs> and, you know, what do I do? The treadmill? And then I lay down on my bed and write and practice my clarinet and take a walk with my wife and you know, I mean, I then watch a basketball game. There's no real adventure in my life. No, no. <laughs> but there is in the movies that you make, and and I think you you know he said something like the artist creates his own world. That that you know you can make the adventure in the in your writing. But yes, you have to. You have to. You're obliged to. To, that's why 90% of the movies you see, if you turn on the television mm -hmm. set and you surf through the movies or something, mm -hmm. almost every channel, some guy's got a gun out or somebody's <laughs> running around, a, you know, chasing after or fighting or people are searching all the time for conflict, for yeah, drama, sure. for, you know, uh, adversarial things that, that engage your interest. But the truth of the matter is, most lives and mine certainly is very quiet and very uh, uninteresting. One, one of the characters in one of the movies, to me, yeah. Well, one of the characters in one of the movies said, uh, "Life doesn't imitate art; it imitates bad television." Yeah, I think that's true. That, well, as you wrote it, so. it, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't uh, imitate art. If it imitated art, it would be a little nicer. Yeah, but it imitates. Cornball, you know, not, not not the best of television, but the well, worst of it. Another thing you said about the, that a central theme of of your movies is the, is the is the sort of reality versus fantasy. Mm -hmm. And at one, I read somewhere where you said, re, you know, reality versus isn't fantasy. Unfortunately, right? Fantasy is much better. Fantasy is much better. You you learn this when you were a child. When I, when I was taken to the movies at five, six, seven years old. And you went into a movie house, and there was a movie on the screen, and it was, you know, whatever it was, Esther Williams in oh, sure. a swimming pool, and uh, the people, you know, poured martinis, and the men were witty and charming, and the women were beautiful, and the, the conflicts were had nothing to do with starvation camps or concentration okay. camps or, yeah. or anything that makes up the, the fabric Sh sure. of uh, society. Well, the per I mean, the Purple Rose of Cairo is a great, is, to me, epitomizes that, right? She's, it's the Depression era woman whose life is in some ways miserable looking at the at all, in fact the, the movie within a movie there is is one of these wonderful 1940s 30s or whatever mm -hmm. you know movies where everyone is drinking cocktails and going to see jazz and and having a lovely time yes and and uh, i would like that i would like to be able to step into a vincent minnelli movie mm -hmm. And never come out of it and just live there the rest of my life. That would be great. See, this is my point I was saying earlier. The, I think, I'm, I'm gonna, not going to give up this point, that your reaction to the meaningless of, meaninglessness of the universe, which is real, but there are two things. In an absurd universe, one of the ways to react is to treat it absurdly, which is comedy. And the other is to create a universe you'd rather be in, whether in my case it happens to be, you know, thinking about, the cosmos and dissociating myself from humanity or making a universe by movie. So it seems to me being that some sense that being driven to comedy and movies are so natural given your view of the world, that comedy is your response to dealing with a meaningless universe. And the other response is to 
is to make movies where where life is better. I already yeah, you're trying to find something good about it. Yeah, uh, and so metaphorically, you think yeah, well, but it doesn't it doesn't work the way. The universe is up there saying. Treat it with comedy, treat it with drama, it doesn't, you know, doesn't matter. get lost, you're all going down the toilet in the end. So all of these things that you try and put a, a positive spin on, you know, don't really cut it when you are absolutely on it. When you wake up at three in the morning and you don't have anyone around to, mm-hmm. and you think to yourself what the real situation is, you know, you, you put a positive spin. So you say, well, isn't one reaction to it uh, religion? Isn't one reaction to it comedy? Can, uh, isn't some, you know, and the meaningless of, ni- of life can be mitigated in this way? I don't think so. I think, um, I always thought the artists, in my opinion, again, mm. this is all me, you well, know, who I'm, cares what I say? But well, I do, that's the, why I'm the, here. The <laughs> artist's, uh, job, in in my case, is to try, given the bleakness of the universe and the fate of man and the emptiness and meaninglessness of it, to find a reason to go on. Mm. Now, it's hard to find a reason to go on cerebrally. Mm. You go on because it's in your blood. The, The blood trumps the brain you you go on because something hardwired in you makes you go on so you can babble about the meaninglessness of night life for hours the guy comes into the room with a gun all of a sudden the meaninglessness vanishes you grab the gun you wrestle with him you 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 know i run but you know <laughs> that, that that's what you do now all you can do is try and find some some way to, and it's very hard to to find a reason to justify life cerebrally. Mm-hmm. I go on with life because something in me is frightened not to, tells me to, urges me to, to preserve myself and to keep going. It's hard for me to make a case for it cerebrally. And so I'm trying in work to make a case for it and to explain to you how you can cope with this terrifying, flying apart, meaningless, absurd mm-hmm. universe. And the best I've been able to come up with um, is that you can only distract yourself from reality. That if you come nose to nose with reality, you're not going to like it. And the real situation is you're checkmated. You you you're not gonna. You there is no good answer, and and you can come up with these metaphors or these or religious things or philosophical explanations. And but in the end, it's a bad deal that we've got. It's a bad situation. <laughs> well, and all you can do is distract yourself. You can watch a show, you can watch a movie, you can get involved in your kids' problems, tutoring them, uh, you can get involved in trivial stuff, so you don't have to think about it. And that's the best advice you can have is don't think about it. Well, you know, actually, this is interesting because I, you talked about Stardust Memories. You talked about the fact that this this comedy director is now faced with the fact that you know, but it's not what he does and meaningful. He's not dealing with the world's problems and it's bothering him, and and he goes around and it's and, and he annoys everyone around him with the fact that he that he he doesn't want to make funny movies anymore. He doesn't think it's worthwhile. But, and and then he and then he meets these aliens. And who's who? And he sort of, you know, tries to ask, "What's the meaning?" And they're basically saying, "Forget it." And they say to him, "If you want to make man, do mankind a service, tell better jokes." Mm-hmm. And in some sense, is that what is was that? That's what I see as the movie version of what you just said. Is that do we mankind a service by telling jokes? You're distracting them from, from. from yes, it's it's you know, uh, you're you're in life. And it's hard and harsh. Mm-hmm. You read the papers, you watch the news. Yeah. Your own life is therefore closing on your mm. your car. You know, you're <laughs> and 
so you go into a movie house. Yeah. Now, you can go into a very serious movie, and it will confront some of these problems, but you never get a satisfying answer. You get some spin that the director or the author wants to give you. But let's say you go into a musical mm -hmm. and you completely forget about your problems for an hour and a half and then you walk out and you're refreshed because you've had a breather, you've had a cold glass of water on a hot day, you're refreshed and you can go on with your life. If you, if you choose to go into a serious thing, if it's entertaining, perhaps it will distract you, but it's also possible that the very problems of the movie, making it a dramatic and serious work, will force you to confront issues, and you won't come out so refreshed. Mm -hmm. So I'm making a case here for certain types of movies or certain types of entertainment as being distraction, and distraction being the best you can do that's why I watch so much sports. I was going to ask you about sports. Uh, yeah, go on. Tell me why. Because it's a distraction. And it gives me a couple of hours where I'm not thinking about the terrible things that exist in life or the terrible existential realities. Mm. I'm just thinking I get lost in a, in a trivial... But it's, the but it's the ultimate in meaninglessness, sports. I mean, and it's, you know, besides the fact there's these genetic freaks, it's, but I think, you see, I mean, it's just who, one person wins, one person loses, and it doesn't mean anything. Right. And yet, interestingly, it means as much as all the universe. Okay. It means no less who wins the game between the Yankees and the Red Sox means as much as the entire existence of the universe. It has no less meaning yeah, than that. Yeah, but what worries me, I agree with you, <laughs> but the problem is that people ascribe meaning to it. it, it and, and that's what, it, it, I would love it if everyone went to sports and said, oh, I'm just entertained, but people care. And 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 actually, that's the thing. I, it is entertaining. Well, insights it's, can be extrapolated yeah. from it. I mean, you know, Hemingway can write about <laughs> bullfighting and yeah. write some interesting things to talk about. And all, mm. but, but when you lose yourself, you know, in a, apparently meaningless entertainment of some sort, a musical or a sporting event, you know, it's got as much meaning as as why you're on earth. L let's go, let's leave sports because we spent too much time on it already. But for you, not only is the universe meaningless, but you don't like nature. <laughs> Do not, no. Yeah, nature no, I mean, is you not say my somewhere friend. I don't like nature. It intrigued me because of a relationship, something you said that reminded me of something that Werner Herzog actually said, did you ever see the movie Grizzly Man? Grizzly Man? No, it was not a, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, okay, it was a movie <laughs> about he made about a, a fellow who lived in Alaska with grizzly bears for many years until he got eaten by one. Is that a documentary? It's a, it's a, well, it's a, this person made documentary footage, and it's a documentary, but Werner used this guy's own footage, which is remarkable footage of grizzly bears, to make a commentary on his life. I may and have seen it. I, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's but a, they didn't show him being eaten by the bear. No, right? they don't show him. That's yeah, right. I think I did see that movie. I, and I, and no, but I, there's a line in there that reminded me a lot of something you you wrote, which is he, he's looking at one point near the end of the movie. They look, they actually have the footage. It was near the end of the season, and they th they think that he's looking at the bear that eventually ate him. Mm -hmm. And and he says, look, and, and there's a close up, and he says, look in those eyes. You know, that's that's indifference. You know, it's not Mother Nature. Nature doesn't care about you. It's it it. You know, the big mistake that he made and that people make is somehow thinking that nature cares about you, mm -hmm. but nature is indifferent. In fact, mm -hmm. it's worse. It's banal. Well, he doesn't say this, but you say it. It's banal. The indifference of the universe is almost evil. Mm -hmm. And and as you said, when you know, even in in a, looking at a looking at a beautiful scene, when you look more closely, you see violence and chaos and murder and cannibalism. And when you look closely at nature, you find it is not your friend. And which are, which I've which is almost the same as looking at bear and saying it's not your friend. It's going to mm -hmm. eat you if it's hungry. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. Okay, but I find that intriguing. It, it, when I read that, it suddenly made, hit hit me why you like New York so much because <laughs> it's the opposite of nature. It, yeah, it's not like cities. Well, yeah, because New York's a city, 
And, you know, I was reading and I was thinking about this in terms of the movie Shadows and Fog that you made, mm -hmm. where, it, it, you know, the night is dangerous mm -hmm. and it's not. And what, what rescues the person is civilization. The, the, yeah. the, the, being alone in a, in a, either in a dark or, or in a natural without, without the, the trappings of civilization around you is what's terrifying. Yes, I agree. That's and, a... But then that's interesting to me. So you're kind of anti-Rousonian in a sense, sort of that man was born free but lives forever in chains. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, I think he viewed the, the primeval man before society as the ultimate free being and society imposes chains on that person. But in some sense... You're saying it really, actually, it's the opposite. Society provides a safety net. Yes, a, a structure and a civilization. You you know, if I walk out into the street, I live in an environment that has other families and restaurants and museums and schools and libraries and theaters. And, you know, it's a, I live in a civilized, structured place, whereas if I'm out in the wild, but I learned this when I was a little kid. I uh, I could see, you know, that uh, animals bite and smell <laughs> and bark and lick and, you know, I mean, there's nothing to commend them to me. You know, other people go crazy. They, you, know, you never had a, didn't, you never had an animal? No. Never. Yeah, when I was a little kid, I didn't like it. I, I, I thought that I would like a dog because every, every kid had a dog. dog. And uh, when I got the dog, you know, it was a big nothing. I mean, the first couple of days, yeah, you were excited. But then, uh, then you have to walk the dog, and the dog runs around the house and makes noise and jumps on the couch and barks. And, <laughs> you know, and I think to myself, where's the, what's the pleasure here? Um, so, but... Of course, billions of people could not disagree with me more fervently. Uh, I, I'm, I was never a, a pet lover. Cats, dogs, birds, okay. fish. Or nature. And the other thing you weren't, you like, I remember trying to convince you to come out to Arizona in the wintertime. Right. And you, and, you said, <laughs> and you said, no way. And then I read you, you said you hate sunshine. Is that because you're a red hair? Uh -uh. I never well, liked sunshine. I don't see the. the uh, it sounds so neurotic, but it, uh, <laughs> you know, I, the sunshine. One, the rays of the sun produce cancer. Forget about that. I'm not someone who's intimidated that way. I mean, okay. I, you know, but y y they cause heat. I don't mm -hmm. like that. Uh -huh. The only one is too hot, uh -huh. and the light that it casts is harsh and unpleasant. So when I get up in the morning and I open my Venetian blinds mm -hmm. and it's sun, you know, once in a while, that's nice. Once in a while. But it's much nicer if I open it and it's a gray day and misty and moody and cloudy and the light is soft and the color saturation is beautiful and it's just, it's and I, if I go out for a walk and the sun's not beating down on me or shining in my eyes and I'm and I'm seeing everything in a in a kind of gray but not an unpleasantly gray does, it's rather a beautiful gray does that impact on the in, in movie making I can't I mean well you work of course with cinematographers who and who themselves determine what lighting they like but, right, do, but, but we do, all you all want the gray days. You all want the gray they days. They want them, and I want them. Yeah, yeah, everyone. So the harsh sunlight is not good for movie making. Not, not for my movies. They're not. No, and maybe for nobody's. But we, we all. There are times where I've, we've made movies where we get on the set in the morning and wait all day long without doing any work at all till the sun starts to drop mm -hmm. at, the, at the five o'clock in the afternoon or something, and only then begin to work because. The sunlight is not so pretty. Yeah, and that's not just your view. That's your that's your your your, your cinematographer. Uh, certainly, the cinematographers would be very happy, you know, uh, shooting in gray. You know, when you see these Swedish movies yeah. and these British yeah. movies, they look so beautiful. Uh, the green grass, or even even in black and white, they're so moody and lovely. So the sunlight, nature, but we're getting back to the fact that somehow. 
the chains of civilization are for you not change there in some sense a security blanket. But at the same time, one of my favorite movies of yours points out the, the at least one of the dangers of living in a society, and that's Zelig, that imposes on people the tyranny of society, of conformity, of the need to blend in. Right. Which which is the part of the chains that Rousseau was talking about, the fact that we have a social contract. When we when we don't blend in well, society punishes us one way or another. In this case, Zelig's parents and other people early on imposing that on on him. And he's the prototypical example of of someone who wants to blend in. Yeah, you want to you want to uh, be liked. Yeah. And uh, in order to be liked, you know, I mean in the simplest sense in that movie, you know, uh, he could read Moby Dick and yeah. if he's with someone who hated the book, he's right along with them. Oh yeah, I hated it and it was terrible and can give reasons and if the person liked it, he can go with that person and anything to to blend in, to to be like, not or, to or offend, to be, or to say you'd read it when you hadn't, which is which is, I think, what. Or to say, yeah, well, that, <laughs> but but because no I think what. didn't I think he was in, in, when he was hypnotized at one point he was embarrassed that he hadn't read Moby Dick as I remember, and and it's interesting to me in that movie that it moves towards fascism that at some point his desire to be part of yeah blend to conform in, go, yeah it ends up next to Hitler. In the movie, yeah, and yeah. Um, and you have come. I, f- I forget whether it's Saul Bellow or someone in the movie comments that it was natural if you want to con- conform. And I think uh, you say the danger of abandoning one's true self uh, to fit in leads to conformity and submission, and to the will and requirements of a strong personality, which naturally leads to fascism. Yes, uh, you know, if you live in a fascist society, uh, it's very hard to be an individual, and and they they constantly forcing you to uh, to live up to the rules of the authoritarian leader and to uh, if you're an artist to make your art conform and and in any way not be outstanding or not be individual and and um in extreme situations is Nazi Germany where mm. and they're all wearing uniforms and and spouting the same thing. And if you don't, the penalties can be very harsh. There, they would kill you. Um, in the social situation, it can just be where you're persona non grata yeah, in the group. Yeah. For... So when, but when I read that, to mission of the will requirements of a strong personality, I couldn't help think of the current climate we're in, in some sense. I want to talk about the left and the right. Okay, so one thinks um, of Trump. I couldn't help think of the fact that, in some sense, th- this base and this and this uh, need to this xenophobia that's a key part of it, of 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 other you know wanting to be the same, that we suffer from that on the right. That Trump's success, if you wish, is people is is in some sense related to people wanting. The right to- is always that. The the right always wants a certain. Conformity, the but, right, you know, the right in any in any country at any time, and the left is always more liberal. That's well, why. yeah, it is, but well, mm-hmm. I want, but I'm not sure it is now. But I would, I wanted to ask you about that because that conform. Were you influenced in Zelig at all? By I know we've talked about this personally about by knowing people who were blacklisted during the 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 fact that during the communist during the period of blacklisting there during the McCarthy era, where clearly nonconformity at some level was labeled, and then you lost your, your whole livelihood. I, I do remember the McCarthy's. I was, I was young for the brunt of it, but since uh, I appeared in that movie, The Front, yeah. and uh, Walter Bernstein wrote it, and he had been blacklisted, and Marty Ritt directed it, and he had been blacklisted, and we hung out together for the duration of the shooting of that picture, uh, I learned a lot about it because everybody, you know, Zero Mostel who starred in the picture, yeah. these people were all blacklisted. So I learned about it and I, I knew about it from, you know, because everybody knows about it and, and I knew about it when some of it was happening, but I was too young to really be um, actively committed to a position on it. Mm. 
Okay, but so that that didn't that didn't play in any in any part in your thinking in terms of Zelig in terms of the 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 the, the blacklisting on the uh, uh, no the blacklisting thing for me was all centered around the front the movie yeah, the front, front yeah I remember which again I only acted in yeah. but I did learn a and, lot about yeah. blacklisting okay. and and uh, you know it's a it was a terrible and ineffective thing and. Well, it was effective for a while at suppressing people. But, you, you you know, you said it's always that way on the right. But I'm a little worried that on the left we see the same kind of necessity for conformity right now. Universities, uh, obviously coming from universities, I see university students not wanting to hear anything they disagree with. Any- well, that's, uh, on the face of it, that's a terrible thing. I mean, that doesn't require any um, kind of real debate or conversation. It's just to a common sense person, you would think that a university, you know, mm-hmm. would not tolerate that, that, that it's a place where there should be a free forum for discussion, uh, even the most uh, unpleasant kind, and these things should be debated, and uh, you're there to learn. You're not there to advance a social agenda. You're there, to, you know. So I never have any patience with that, you know, when, when a university stifles free speech. Now, you then get into some nuances here. I yeah. mean, if some guy gets on stage and says, uh, you know, uh, so go home and get your rifles and go kill all the Jews, yeah, yeah, kill yeah. all the black people. Yeah, yeah. You know, That's I mean, there is a line that a common sense person can figure out that this thing is not rocket science. You hear a guy talking and he and he's um, uh, uh, trying to advance a, a, a political position that's hateful to you, that's fine as long as it doesn't cross in a fact, certain line. You can argue with them to death. In fact, that's Just, what free speech is all about, is to guarantee the speech you that, don't that's like. That's the rather point than, of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, as long as you're not inciting violence, I think that's the, the key know. point. But we're seeing that the universities what's a, what's a, are, are now, not just the students, but when the students complain, the universities are in, immediately kowtowing, and you're getting this this rule of social justice, of of uh, of conformity that is every bit as 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 uh, restricting as you used to say the, the, the you know the fascism was in one in one way or another. That you know, there's that <clears throat> famous those the Yale students who are yelling at that Yale professor when of they talk about the ability to Halloween. A common sense person will see that as, but. But, but you know, why that the common sense isn't happening in university administrations? It's really worrisome. Commercial institutions, whether it's a mm. university, a television network, mm. a Hollywood studio, uh, a job uh, mm. in a business, they're very quick to succumb to the slightest kind of pressure because they feel even a small pinch here and there in their pocketbook. Yeah. And and that terrifies them. They don't know how deep that pocket is going to go, and they get terrified. So a university or a television network or a film studio or a, a publishing house or a, 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 job, a, a business will buckle under at the slightest pressure. And someone like yourself watching that or someone watching that, will say, God, that's so terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, this guy uh, listened to folk music in the <laughs> 50s and now he can't get a job because they, they're afraid he's a communist. <laughs> but um, yeah, and this is a, one of the many terrible traits of uh, the human personality. Uh, it, 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 it folds under pressure. Look, you lived in Germany in the 30s, and you lived or all over Europe, and you lived next door and were friendly with Jewish families, and your kids played together, and you had no problem at all, and then you got some pressure, and yeah. as soon as the pressure, you were ready to dump them right into the concentration camps, it's you just, know, it, shoot yeah, them, I mean, get rid of them, and because, and, you know, basically people are frightened. They live their lives in terror. They live in terror uh, the existential terror we were talking about before, and they live in terror of, you know, they, they want only to survive. They don't want trouble. They, they're and not we tend, looking for trouble. And we tend, to, we tend to reward virtue signaling in all these cases, meaning we tend to reward in the communist era, you know, in the, in the McCarthy era, 
labeling the communists and the in Germany labeling the Jews, and now labeling the those who who offend uh, by their speech but as being a, as yeah. being as being. And it's not just condemning that. It's just not. It's it's just condemning anyone who who is associated with that. It's kind of a really strong. Yes, it's an insidious to... thing. And and you know uh, what happens is the 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 first person gets uh, fired, mm-hmm. and a wave of panic comes yeah. in after that, and everyone associated with him gets yeah. fired. And and you know, but this this is this is what people are. They're they're and and it's hard to blame. It's hard to despise them or blame them for their timorousness or cowardice, mm. cowardliness, or their it's, it's their, yeah because you, people are afraid and they're because alive. people are people are frightened. They're living in a in a in a difficult but then you know i remember those lines about first they came for the lawyers and then they came for the you know and then they came for me i mean ultimately it's there but for the grace of god go i is what seems to me to be to the way to protect society if you realize that whatever is happening to other people can happen to you uh yes yes uh, but nobody but it's it's hard when it actually happens when you're if you're uh, running a school or running a television network mm-hmm. and uh, somebody, you know, gets in some kind of trouble, social trouble, mm-hmm. you're thinking, what do I need it for? Yeah. You know, I'm I'm trying to make a living. I run this network. I, I run this university. I'm trying to earn some money and do a good thing. I could just as easily have a professor working here who's smart and the kids love, who's not connected to uh, anti-Israel yeah. boycott or something. So what do I need it? And and, and that's the way people are. They're not yeah. looking for trouble. They're, and so most people are not ready to take a stand. The la- One of the last lines in Zelig is, one wonders what would have happened if right at the outset he'd had the courage to speak his mind and not pretend. And I... I, I, when I, I, that really resonated with me to think about that, because ultimately, it seems to me that the health of society depends on people willing to speak their mind and not pretend. Yes, I, I would guess, and I'm only guessing because I know nothing about what I'm talking about, of course, <laughs> is that it would work. That uh, that if if the students at a university say, we don't like this professor because he's uh, is t- is saying this, if the university said, I'm sorry... That's, uh, but he's a accredited professor, and he's free to talk that way. And if you don't like it, you can drop the course. Or if you don't like the university, register someplace else. If they took that stand, it would, I think, be just a very short time before the situation would be better. Yeah, no. That it would not suddenly, the university would not look up after a while and say, gee, everybody left. I don't think that would Yeah, happen. they're still going to be there. again, easy for me to say because it's not my college, it's not my business, or the or the network is not my network. So I can be brave and, <laughs> and, you know, and again, I'm not living next to somebody. I wonder if they took my neighbor away and said, you know, we're taking away all people who are vegans uh-huh. and uh, we're going to shoot them. Uh, would I have the nerve to say, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, and and they say yes. Do you want to make trouble? Because we're going to take away your neighbor and shoot him because we don't want vegans. Um, I don't know how courageous how, I would well, be. Well, personally, but do you think that because the movies for you are a chance to to some extent escape reality, although reflect on reality certainly, even if in your personal life, can you though make a movie then in some sense that like Zelig or something else that does make that statement that hopefully. Uh, you know, through through the movie making, can you do the kind of things that one that you might do in, in not in in real life? I mean, in terms of speaking out, uh, you could. I'm not the filmmaker for that, only because I, I'm not a social or political filmmaker. Because it, it, it isn't in me artistically well, not, for whatever but not, reason. But not directly political. But Zelig, in some sense, well, causes yeah, you to, yeah, causes but, uh, you to reflect on this. Obliquely. You know, I, I finish a film and I sit home, I think, well, what's my next film going to be about? And whatever it is, it could be a murder mystery, mm. it could be a musical, it could be a, a, a romance or, a, or a, a drama. Whatever happens to hit me, you know, it's so hard to get decent ideas that 
as soon as an idea comes that looks like it will form into a coherent beginning, middle, and end, you tend to go with that because they yeah. don't grow on trees. Yeah. So I don't sit there and think, well, this uh, this is a good idea, but it doesn't make a social statement or it doesn't say anything. I don't care about that. I I'm happy. To, you're happy to have ideas. Well, that, that's a wonderful. I wanted to go into the ideas and the process you make, and ask you: Do you think you're first and foremost a writer or a filmmaker? I, I think probably a writer. That, that uh, because if they, they said to me tomorrow, you can't make any more films, uh, not give you another penny. I would be, you know, I would write. I'd write for the theater. And if they said to me in the theater, we're not going to produce any of your plays because we hate you. And mm -hmm. uh, I would say, well, then I'm going to write books. And if they said we won't publish any of your books, I would still write them because if they're good, they will see the light of day eventually. And if they're no good, then I'm lucky. Nobody's, <laughs> no, no, no. nobody's <laughs> publishing them. You know, so it's a win-win situation. The, for me, the fun is doing the thing. I don't care if I'm laying on my bed writing a film script, a play, or a book or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter. It's the, it's the writing. Uh, I think they put the pencil well, on the paper. The well, you know, I, I, the paper. That, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You did once say, I always feel like I'm writing with film. Yeah, that's what you're doing. You yeah. you you spend uh, eight weeks, ten weeks, whatever, until your money runs out, uh, accumulating what you would be doing. It would be as if you were gathering words from a dictionary mm -hmm. and and keep getting all the words you think are going to be relevant to the yeah. story. Well, I'm gathering all the footage, and then I'm going to make it into a story. And I change it. It's very malleable in the mm. editing. I don't write something and it's all, you know, rigid. Uh, it's very malleable. I, I put the end at the beginning and put the <laughs> middle in the end and change this and make it about something else and put in narration and change the direction totally. Uh, it, for me, it's a living, breathing thing till it's completely finished and I have to hand it in. So I always feel that I'm writing, well, and I'm happy writing, and I don't, as I say, I don't really care if I if I wrote stuff and threw it in the drawer, and long after I'm dead, people read it and love it, or, hey. you know, the, the public is spared it because <laughs> it's so terrible. Well, okay, now th this is interesting to me because it seems to me you, what you just said is kind of a more optimistic view of filmmaking that I've read in the sense that I wonder whether making a film for you is the least enjoyable part of the process. The more I read about it. The, <laughs> so I mean, the actual filming. The, yeah, yeah. You know, the actual filming is hard. Yeah, you see, it's hard because, work. Again, when you're home writing, mm -hmm. you write if you get a little tired, yeah, yeah, you yeah. go make yourself tea and there you... You know, or get on the treadmill, yeah. or yeah. you know, go for a walk. You, your own boss. You're writing. Nothing like writing. When you're making a film, all of a sudden they hit the taxi meter yeah. at you know 150 grand a day or yeah, more, yeah, yeah. and they say, "Well, you've got eight weeks, and then you're not going to have any more money to pay the cab driver." Yeah, and you got to start working, and you know, you got to get up in the morning and it's maybe cold out and rainy and unpleasant and you got to get out there and be funny at seven o'clock in the morning and keep going and be fun and wolf down your lunch and be funny all afternoon and make the right decisions and everybody's coming to you with decisions that you're completely unqualified to make do i know which gun i should pick for the guy to have or which <laughs> costume that she should wear wearing a, a you know a red blouse or an orange blouse or and, and these shoes and do i want the cigarette case to look like this and the what kind of car would he drive? And, you know, I, I don't know any of these things. <laughs> and I I make those decisions and um, in ignorance and in terror. And, I'm, and, and you're working all day and then you knock off at night and you're exhausted. You look at what you did in the, the day before. And it's always, oh, God, did I, <laughs> did I, I could have done that so much better. And then you go home, you're exhausted. Before you know it, you're waking up in the morning. And you, Now, this is not 
physically pleasant. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's, it's a difficult uh, but regimen, but you know that only lasts lasts. Uh, you know, for me because I have limited money, mm -hmm. eight ten <laughs> weeks. Okay, but it's to me. I'm not. It's not just the physical. If I at least write, read what you've written, it's also the intellectual. You you say it seems to me that from what you're writing, that the writing is the m most fun for you. you. You said once, when I actually start writing, I can celebrate because that is the day that everything's over. Because yes. all the agonizing work is done before that, which I assume is, uh, which amazes me. So for you, the thinking of the plot and all that stuff is agonizing. And mm -hmm. then once you, and you somehow have it in your brain, you don't, do you make notes? Almost none. And, and so you agonize over all that thinking, and then you write, and it's and you say it's just an ultimate pleasure, but you say thinking of it, planning it, plotting it is is is, uh, is uh, that's hard. So, yes, uh, writing it down is pleasurable. When you when you're sitting in a room by yourself, or walking the streets by yourself, and you're trying to think of what to do and envision a story with characters that begins here and there's subplot here, hmm. and you're gonna and you're trying to think the thing out, this is a nightmare, and this goes on for weeks, maybe months, uh, before you come up and you discard this, that you're working on this idea, thinking about nothing else for six weeks in a row, and then you realize this is not going to be a good movie, this is not going to work, and you start from scratch again to think of, well, do I want to do a movie about a car thief? Do I want to do a movie about a parachute jumper? Do I want to do something about a brain surgeon? You know, you're thinking... And then finally, you come up with an idea and it structures out. When you have that and you sit down to write it, it's pleasurable. It's fun to write, you know, act one, scene one. But it seems, yeah, but it, you, you write about it as if it's, yeah, it's such a pleasure. And it surprises me to say that, hear that. First of all, you must, it's amazing to me that you can have it all in your head and then you can just write out the dialogue and the scenes it's it's so structured in your brain already that you just yeah, write just it write in no it time you just as far as I, from what i read you just zoom it out boom boom and yeah, you enjoy every fast. moment of it which by the way i have to say from my experience is somehow the opposite of my experience not so much well in writing but also in science it's the thinking that's the fun part and the puzzling that's the fun part and gosh when you, after you figured it out and you have to write up the paper it's the last thing in the world you want to do is write it up. And so a lot of people just leave it, I mean, in their drawers for, for a long time. And I, so the writing is, is much less fun than the, than the puzzling, which is, so it, it it's was interesting. Yeah. It's, that you, you like uh, to figure then, it out. Yeah. And then, and then it's <laughs> funny for me when I'm writing, then in my other hat, when I write books, in some sense, I enjoy the writing, but only once I get into it, the thought of sitting down sometimes is, is overwhelming to me. And that barrier of, oh, my God, how am I going to, I have this idea, and I love the idea, but how am I going to put it into words? It just, and then once I do, what I enjoy most about writing is I have no idea where it's going. When I start to write, I think I'm going to, you know, even in the nonfiction books, and I think I know the subject, but I think I'm going to head here, and then the, the writing takes me over here to a very roundabout way of describing where I thought I'd end up at the very beginning. But mm -hmm. for you... When you're no, writing, that would be you know fatal for me. It would be fatal for you. Yeah, I have to know where I'm going. Otherwise, you know, you want you working, working for weeks, and you mm -hmm. start writing, and you come up with twenty, fifty, seventy pages, and you're out. Mm -hmm. You 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 haven't figured out where the mm -hmm. the flower flowers. Yeah. You know what I mean. You mm -hmm. and you're then and you got sixty pages that are quite good. But it doesn't go any place, and you have no climax. You have no story mm. that matures. So it's that I have to know. So, you, so when you write, sit down and write, you know where you're going, and you're very rarely surprised that the that the writing takes you anywhere else. You've not, you haven't yeah. had that experience ever, where you <laughs> even when it works out, whether you think you're going to write a movie about this, and you had you no, have the whole plot you're out in mind, and then when you start to write it. That's, That's a bad feeling. Lucky man. Lucky no, man. no, no. It's all. It's, I, I know this from other writers too. Uh, you're out of control. Your you, your characters take mm -hmm. over. They say, and if your characters take over, you're out of control. You 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 want to control. You know, so, someone who's writing dramatically for a movie yeah. or play or something. I could, if I 
just had a good climax only to start, I, I'm I got it. I'm home free. Yeah. I can always get. You know, Moss yeah. Hart said. Mm -hmm. Third act problems are the killers. Mm -hmm. Nobody has first act. Mm -hmm. And I understand that completely. If you have a good third act and, and you know, you know what you're, then the rest is all easy. You can get up there 500 ways. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. So, so, but you have to know, or I have to know, where I'm going specifically, and I and I don't want to start writing so, till I know I have that. Otherwise, you know, really, you do write. You know, when I wrote um, Purple Rose of Cairo, the guy comes off the screen mm. and he sees Mia Farrow in the audience, and she falls in love with him, and he with her, and the guy has stepped off the screen, and people, the characters, are mm. panicked on the screen, mm. and people are coming into the movie has to see it. Now I'm finished with fifty pages. And I'm sitting there, and it doesn't go anywhere. I got, uh, and I got no place to go. So then, what happens? Now he's off. He's met her. She likes mm -hmm. him. Now what do I do? So I was out, and I took the thing. This was after a lot of work. I threw it in the drawer, and I figured, well, that's it. It just doesn't work. And six months later, after I did another film or something, mm -hmm. it occurred to me that the actor who came off the screen was a screen thing of an imaginary <laughs> character. What if the actor playing him in Hollywood came back okay. and there were two of them and there was a, all of a sudden, Everything. in two weeks' time, the thing just flowered like a, a rose bush and I had a very good story, a, so, a film of mine that I, I really yeah, liked. No, it's, yeah, it's, one of my, it's a great movie. And but okay, but that's the so for you when you say when I start writing it's finished that wasn't an example of it but what it really means is when you have the good third act and you know where it's going then then it's a pleasure yeah then, then and it, I, but I I usually structure out most of the thing in my mind I know I know where I'm going yeah. and I know where the fun is going to be and, and okay so the thinking and the puzzling is agonizing. The writing is a pleasure, but then what I meant by the fact is not that maybe the making the film isn't the favorite part. It wasn't just the the physical uh, problems. You you say as the process goes on, casting, shooting, editing gets worse and worse for me. When I'm finished, I look at it and I'm disappointed. The mm -hmm. idea for the film was so beautiful and everything so great, and then little by little, I wounded it. Writing, casting, shooting, editing, mixing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it again. So. And I, I always wonder, when I first met you, I remember I was flying from Australia and I happened to see Annie Hall again after 25 years. I hadn't seen it before. And I told you, and you said, I haven't, and you told me, I haven't seen it since I made it. And I, now I know that you don't watch any of your movies after you make them. Mm -hmm. Is this the reason? Yeah, because uh, you can only be disappointed. The things on film, you know, if I saw Annie Hall now, I think, oh, I could do this so much better. I got a much better joke for here. Why didn't I say this? Why? How, how could I say such a stupid thing? Mm -hmm. You know, so what do I want to torture myself for? So I don't, I don't ever watch them because I can't do anything about them. So I, was, I don't watch them. Would, uh, would, would you be happiest if, in an imaginary world, you could just have ideas for films and write the scripts and never make the movies? And they pay no, you? No, no, I have to make the movie so it comes out the way I want it. I, I did that on my first movie, What's New Pussycat? Which you? And uh, it was an embarrassing, stupid movie and a terrible experience. And I vowed that I would never. Yeah, never do, do it. That was what I made could. you decide to go for always have the control of writing and directing. And, and yes, because you're shocked. You know, to you, to to one, to mm -hmm. me in this case, it's common sense what to do. But you give it to someone else, and you can't believe that they don't understand the simple common sense. sense of, they're not stupid. They're yeah. good, and they're professionals. But you, you know. I think Groucho once said that um, he was talking about timing and said, people don't realize that just one extra syllable totally will ruin a joke. Mm -hmm. They don't They don't understand that. And I see that. I said, can't you see that if I say he woke me up, it's funny. If I say he awakened me, <laughs> it's not funny. funny. One is going to make an audience laugh, and the other is not. 
and they they can so it's just like if someone said to me can't you hear that when the guy comes to that passage that he's it's a little flat his clarinet is a little mm-hmm. flat mm-hmm. or his trumpet's gone a little sharp there i said no it sounds great to me and he said no he said, can you, you don't hear his little sharp we're going to take that passage again and well people don't hear it and and you can't believe it if you can do it yourself so i have to make those things because um so they're not ruined i want them to be what i want them to be you want to ruin yourself instead of letting someone else yes exactly (laughs) if it's going to be ruined uh i want to be i want to ruin it but but i actually was asking a sort of somewhat different direction if there was an imaginary world where no one would make the film where you could just have ideas and write scripts and not have the agony of of watching I won't write film scripts, for sure. Because no. film is a director's medium. Okay, so you said somewhere, making the film is a big struggle, but I would rather struggle with films than other things. So yeah. so mm-hmm. it's really, you you do want to make the movies. I mean, it's movies are what you want to do. Well, movies are only what I want to do because people back them. Yeah. And, it's, and the hardest part about making a movie is raising the money for it. Yeah, yeah. And so... If people back them, if people keep coming forward and saying, yes, you need this much money for a movie, we'll put it up, I'd be a fool to say no. Yeah, yeah, sure. But but uh, if someone tomorrow said to me, I can't get any backing, no one's going to back any of your films, they don't like you, uh, then fine. I, I mean, that's okay with me. I, I'm very happy to write for the theater. I would not write film scripts and give them to mm. other people. Yeah, okay. I write okay. plays. But you wouldn't write the film scripts. But, okay, but the struggle, but you but you realize it's a struggle, and it seemed to me, you want to, at some level, you want to struggle. And because, I mean, one of the things that I admire so much about you, again, having known you personally and learned this, is your work ethic. And the the discipline you have, and you said it, you said the work is all that matters. All I do is work. If I just keep working, everything else will walk, fall in place. You finish a movie, it, you don't luxuriate in it. You're the next day, you're, you're, you're writing the next movie, and it's work. And you say you don't care whether the films are successful or not, whether they're... You know, right, the fun is making the film. When you're a kid, you think, oh, I'll write this film, or I'll direct this film, I'll make it, and I will be famous, and I'll go to parties, and I'll win Oscars, and I'll do it. And, mm. and you envision some glamorous mm. fantasy thing. Then you realize quite quickly when you get older and you get into film that all of that is less than meaningful. I mean, it, none of it is satisfying or fun or anything. And what you look at and say, hey, what was really fun was creating that thing. And so when you're finished with a film, I don't mean to be arrogant. I uh, when I say I don't care. I always like when people like my films. Yeah. But if they don't like them, there's nothing I can do yeah. about it. I made the film and there it is. So what am I going to sit home and brood? That they don't? I made the film. I gave it my best shot. I hope you like it. If you don't like it, nothing I can do about it. I, if you do like it, great. But I'm I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned with with you know when any Hall won the Academy Awards, someone said, "Weren't you thrilled?" I'm thinking to myself, when Andy Hall won that, I had made Andy Hall a year ago. <laughs> yeah. I was working on another film. I'm not I'm not interested. You know, people now will call me and tell me how a film is doing. Yeah, and I'm thinking. I don't care how the film is doing. Do I care that in in Budapest or uh, Omaha or someplace the film had a great weekend? What does that mean to me? It means nothing. I I finished that film, you know, six, eight, ten months ago, and haven't seen it since or thought about it since. It's history. Yeah, so, no. so so I don't really care. I've I've I have a film now that's playing in Europe. What, it doesn't matter to me. I finished another film. I'm 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 worried about the editing on this film and getting the no. jokes right and getting the romances right and things. And I'm thinking, God, I have an idea for a new film. Uh, but let um, me ask you. Well, first of all, I've, that's what I've always admired that attitude, which is so amazing. I mean, I remember, I've written books and I remember agonized. I mean, I, I you know just wanting to know how it's doing and wanting and 
were you, was this always your attitude or were you, when you started, did you have that pie eyed view of, oh, I, I want to win the awards. I want to be famous. I want to have the glamour or were you always, did you never suffer under that illusion? I never thought about awards because I was thinking of survival. I had so much trouble with take the money and run. I, yeah. uh, you know, I was so sure it was going to flop because I was such an amateur putting it together and, and bananas. I wasn't even thinking in those terms. Um, and, uh, and then on, when I came to the movie Love and Death, which is like the fourth yeah. movie I made, United Artists, came in with a cotton, a cardboard cotton, with a thousand reviews from all over the country. And they said, why don't you read those reviews and give us a nice quote from each one that you want. We'll make up a big quote ad using a hundred <laughs> quotes or something. And I started reading them. And they were, you know, they were good reviews, for 99% of them. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy likes this, this guy like this, to this guy I'm a genius, to this guy I'm an idiot because I didn't know this and I copied this and I'm too slow here and there I was revolutionary. And, mm. you know, I'm thinking, if I read through all of these, I learn nothing, just you hear people's opinions on things. And, and so I put them aside. I said, you make up the quote ad you want. And I never, ever, ever looked at another word written about me in interviews, news stories, on television, reviews. Now, people used to say to me, oh, you should read Vincent Canby, what he said about you. Do you know? My God, the review's so glowing. Never, ever read a word. Of, it's a remarkably never, healthy. Had, I have, you know, it's a... It's it's not a temptation. It's not a. Well, that's like, a you're lucky. Wanna, you're lucky wanna, it comes naturally because just want to see where he says you know masterpiece. You know, forget it. It's it's you don't want that. You don't want to obsess over yourself. Well, that, you know, you don't want to sit in a room and think, God, that guy was right. I am shallow. I should turn to deeper themes. Or, yes, I'm quite brilliant, and <laughs> I, I think you don't you you don't want that. You don't want to think about yourself. You want to think about. Put your nose to the grindstone and think about the work. A good plot. The good plot, good, good, good plot, good work. I mean, good that's, what, that's what I mean by funny. not being neurotic. It's the, uh, the your attitude towards your work is, is healthier than, than, uh, than mine has been. I know that. But at the same time, it also illustrates something, because I want to make that connection to science, that people think that, that it ultimately art and science are selfish. In a sense, what you're doing is doing it for yourself. You're doing, if you're working hard, the best thing you can do, but you're also doing it because you enjoy it. It satisfies you. And and most scientists don't become scientists to save the world. They do it because they, they, they enjoy it. Because they enjoy it. You're and, doing something and, you love. And if you don't enjoy it, you rarely do a good job. Okay. Right. And you probably think you've never worked a day in your life. Exactly. You probably think, you know, yeah. hey, they're yeah. paying me to play baseball. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, it. hey, this is you just know. the best thing I'm playing. Yeah. I'm playing every day. Right. And so I feel the same way that, that, that uh, I'm doing this for myself, that uh, a certain amount of people enjoy it. That's great. That's a, that's a perk. It's a bonus. I, I love that. But, you know, now it's a Spartan life. Mm-hmm. You know, you you don't make a movie, for example, and luxuriate in adulation and go to parties and accept your awards and think because you got mm. these awards, you're better than you really are, and you and you don't go to your opening night and a party afterward yeah. and and suddenly you're surrounded by fascinating women and brilliant men and you're mm -hmm. You know, uh, no, that's, that's, um, you, you lead a Spartan life. You work and, and you, you go home and you work the next day and... And the work, yeah. Well, see, I, I, I mean, the fact that work entered three times in that sense, you, you've said it, the work is what drives you. But at the same time, I have to say, when I listen to you, and maybe you should feel good about this, I think of Richard Feynman. The physicist Feynman, um, oh yeah, yes, who is a one, who is another yeah. idol of mine. I should but, be so yeah, lucky. But, yeah, mm -hmm. but two things, you know, when when the Nobel Prize, he said, yeah, "Are you thrilled?" He said, "No, I was thrilled when I had the answer to the question." Then the prize, you know, the prize doesn't matter. He also said, and there's a famous book. It was his, it was his 
wife uh, tragically died early who said, why do you care what other people think? Those two things, when I think about you, that, that it's the work that's, it, you know whether, if you're satisfied with it, you're satisfied with it. And if you're not, you're not. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. And, when you, and it doesn't matter what other people think. But, but, but Feynman was also, he it appeared miraculously to come up with solutions to things people didn't see. There was like 50,000 pages of hard work that he, in yeah, his life that he'd done. It's hard work. Work. It's the it's, detective it's work. work, the tedious and, checking of, and it's you know, a, and and it's the work. So I, you know, I we're getting near the end, and I want to just, I, you know, I, I, it all came together to me, and I said to you earlier, it was in the middle of the night. Maybe that's crazy, but when I when I think of this being driven by these existential questions, and you say basically, yeah, you're doing this, but if you're not asking the deep questions, you're really not doing what you should be doing. You know, you, you you're doing That's hard. That's me on my own personal. Well, but you think about that in art in general. If you're, you know, when you compared Flaubert versus Tolstoy or Kafka, no matter how good you are as a craftsperson, if you're not dealing with the deep questions that are hard to address, then you're not then you're not really doing it. And you've got to work hard. And 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 so I I think of when I think of your response to this meaningless universe by the work you do, which you claim is to distract, but you also say it's the work. Uh, and it's hard, and it's a struggle. I hear all those things coming out. I couldn't help thinking, for me, the prototypical existential thing is Camus and Sisyphus. The myth of Sisyphus, of Sisyphus rolling a boulder up a hill for eternity, because at the top, the gods have forced the boulder to go down. It's this meaningless existence that he's pushing. The ball almost gets up, rolls down again. And then Camus says, I think Sisyphus was smiling. Yeah, and, and he says that because he wants to put a good spin on no, it. No, but I think that no, that's no, that's, what a, that's his version of Catholicism or Judaism. No, no, well, maybe. Or, no, I think it's know, less. It's I don't think I think it's less rosy. I think it's less nonsense. rosy. You, 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 I don't buy it. No, the, no, I don't think it's. I I disagree. I think what he's saying is what you said. In some sense, is that it doesn't mean rolling of this thing up this hill is meaningful. It's meaningless. But you're here. You're stuck. You've got to find meaning, and I see y you beautifully finding meaning in your work and your comedy. Not saying, not thinking that it's that it means anything no, for the I'm cosmos. No, I'm finding distraction. It's a distraction because it allows you to get through <laughs> the rolling the boulder up the hill. I got to tell you, I got a joke in my new uh, okay. movie, Rifkin's Festival, which okay. I just finished shooting in Spain. It's coming out, and. Well, he's Sean, who's playing the intellectual. Oh, 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 great. He's in it again. Okay. Says, I have this dream. Someone mentions Sisyphus. He says, I have this dream where I'm pushing a boulder up the hill, and the boulder keeps rolling down. I'm pushing it and pushing it. He says, Finally, I get it up there. And then what the hell do I have? A boulder on a hill. <laughs> and I think that's true. Then yeah. what do you got? Yeah, then so, what do you got? So, yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. You, you know, you solve the technical problems, the physical problems, the problems of the world. You get the boulder on the hill, and the gods don't stop you. It gets up there. Then what do you got? You got empty life with a boulder on a hill. You know, a meaningless but, but universe, it, and now it's up but there. But it's meaningless. But if you make me, but if you, if you get, if you get, if the struggle. If this rolling, a struggle is, is a distraction. It's and a that's distraction, good. and if it, you make it, you know, if it, if, it, if you make it meaningful, even if you realize it has no cosmic, cosmic significance, if you get joy in the searching, and I do, I as a scientist, I get more joy in the searching than the answering. The struggle of, of yeah, figuring it you out. Know, if if some guy comes in and steps on your toe hard, yeah. and you oh geez, I think you broke my toe. I got to go to the emergency room. You get the same distraction. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, yeah, you're, but if I you, you're not choice. thinking about yeah. uh, uh, the universe flying apart, you're thinking about oh, if I, I gave get you my the choice toe, of having me step you on your know. toe when you woke up in the morning, or getting up and putting that pen to paper and making your next movie, you'd make the next movie because that's the struggle that you want to do. It's a, yeah, it's a struggle that I can handle. But but if I get up in the morning and uh, someone says to me, you know, you got to get down to the motor vehicle bureau and renew your license. Uh, oh God, this is the last day. 
that's also a struggle, and I'm caught up in that <laughs> trivia, and I'm not thinking I'm, I'm going to Motor Vehicle Bureau, and I have to maybe take the test again, and the universe is flying apart. I'm not <laughs> thinking that. I'm thinking about the Motor Vehicle. So it distracts me. Okay. And, you know, but then, I, I'm a big fan of distraction because I feel the situation is irredeemably grim, bleak. Unsolvable and uh, absurd, and uh, the only thing you can do, like in Hemingway's mm. story, The Killers, and he says to the guy, well, "Gee, it's terrible, it's horrible." And I think about it. He's well, don't think about it. Don't think about it. Okay. Well, you know I, that would be a wonderful place to end, but I'm going to go on for a minute, because two minutes. Because I, I think that's a wonderful way to sum up. But at the same time, I want to quote a poet that you liked, and I, I learned this. I learned this poem. I don't want to appear more erudite than I am from watching a movie. I watched a recent movie. Did you see Jojo Rabbit? Do you know Ta- well, I haven't you know, seen it yet. Taiki no. Waititi. I, it's an amazing. I, I'm so impressed with it. Let me just say. Oh, I can't he, wait to see quotes, it. I've heard, I've heard very good things about he it. He quotes Rilke, who is a, a poet. Rilke, yeah. Like, uh-huh. And there's such an amazing quote, which I let everything happen to you beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. And I thought, well, you know, that's that's not such a bad w- way to end this either. Is that okay? It's good. no feelings. Finally, you just keep plugging away. You just keep plugging away. <laughs> You know, he's got no no choice. No, well, no, no, choice. But you have, say. no, no. But you, people do have a choice. They can they, they can despair. They can say, "Look, it's th- this Believe is the worst me, thing." He, he's, gonna... he, he's despairing when he when he when he <laughs> tells you this. You know, he's he's only telling you this because he's despairing. Re- mm. Read better. Uh, yeah, but he uh, did. Uh, you know, uh, the one who wrote Obad. Oh yeah, no, I forget names. You I'm know, no okay, the, the, yeah. The, the, now I'll both forget. Read that and see what you think of that. Okay. See how you feel after you've <laughs> read that. <laughs> okay, but for me, the struggle, the, jo- the the terror, it's just it's a distraction. But it's all we have. As you said, reality is awful, but it's the only. Only place to get a good steak, right? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. And yeah. Uh, well, that would I want to that look that summer sums up the profound aspect of this. I want to end it with one last thing, because it's important to me, which is I was reading. You know, you were when you cast. Yeah, you, I read a thing about Jodie Foster writing you and saying, "Could I be in one of your things?" And you know, you pointed out that you generally get, you know, you have a, Julia Taylor and people who cast for you, and but sometimes there's someone you know, and they and you think about it, and you put them in a role, and you contact them, and you say, "Oh, that was that was right for you, Jodie Foster," and she was in one of your movies. And so, mm-hmm. so I was going to say that would that ever happen if there was like a short Jewish physicist. <laughs> A short Jewish physicist, physicist who may, you might want to, you know, if he said, I I want to, you know, if short you ever have a role for me. Jewish physicists <laughs> are not box office. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Woody. It was, it, it's, I, I could go on for hours, but thank you very much. I'm sure they're all asleep by now, and if they're not, they should be. <laughs> okay, thanks. Philip Larkin. Philip Larkin, right. Yeah, okay, there Larkin we go. But we did. Like Couldn't you yell that out earlier? <laughs> <laughs> The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, John and Don Edwards, Gus and Luke Holwerda, and Rob Zepps. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash originspodcast.